We've reached the point in our video series that we are now on 6th Street, uh, just beyond the Federal Building. And in our last video, we were looking at this space right here and, and what was there. And we talked about uh, the Times Herald Building being there. But before the Times Herald Building, there was another building here. This building right here, the J.J. Lawler Livery, otherwise known as a hack barn. And of course, hacks in those days were carriages. John Lawler was a native of Canada. His parents came to Michigan in 1853, and he learned the blacksmith's trade. In 1875, he engaged in the livery business over on Huron Avenue. That was his first one, and that burned down. And, uh, he started this one up on 6th Street, uh, and that was about 1878, I believe. There are other businesses in this building as well. As we zoom in here, we can see on the south side, uh, Thomas Vomazny customer. And uh, it looked like he did a pretty good business because if you look at this ad here, they pretty much specialize in theatrical costumes. So uh, they had the Opera House uh, on Water Street. They had the Opera House on Military Street. They had the Majestic uh, Theater. Uh, they had also had stage plays on uh, Grand River or back then Butler. And then, of course, the Desmond, uh, which early on also had plays uh, on military as well. So this just wasn't some place for Halloween. It also looks like they did a pretty good mail business. They would send uh, these costumes any place in the country for a rental, uh, COD, of course. But uh, this is a little bit about this company. They were probably fairly well known in the area and perhaps even nationally. Costumes representing all nations and characters, kings, queens, princes, soldiers, and peasants. Weeks to rent as well. Another reason I think they did really well is because they eventually bought out the livery. The Lawler name was removed and the Lamazny name went up there and, and it became the Lamazny livery. So he was obviously a pretty good businessman. On the bottom of the card it shows it has two locations. The other one was at uh, the corner of 11th Street and Water Street. Of course, that part of Water Street is no longer there. That was also their home, so uh, I don't know if they actually had a business there or they just had an office there, but it sounds pretty good, two locations. When I was researching uh, Tom Lavazny, I found out that he was from Ireland and uh, his vocation was actually a, a tailor. So that would fit right in to make a costume for the theater. As we scan over to the right side of the delivery, we'll see, of course, the arts there. That's where the hacks and the horses entered the delivery. And then over here, it looks like the building isn't occupied at the present time, or at least that part of the building. But you see a lot of posters put up for the different theaters, uh, uh, acts that were coming to town. But at one time, this, uh, this portion of the delivery was occupied. It was occupied by a barber. And the reason we know this is from the Sanborn map that uh, if we look carefully where the arrow is in the north part of the livery, we can see that it says Barber there. And so I started looking through some old ads and see if perhaps I could find a barber shop that would uh, match that location. And I did. And here it is. It's not a real clear picture, but you can make out the barbers there and the chairs and the, the stove there on the right. And I'll try to read this for you and see if we can figure out what it says. The Palmer Barbershop, catering especially to those who wish to appear in their best advantage. We have the barbers with the know-how, electric massage and shampooing, baths, cigars, compressed air. Coolest shop in the city. I'm surprised they use that term. I always thought that being cool was, you know, 1950s stuff. Or maybe they just meant they had a good ventilation system. Who knows? This building was there for a, a long time. Before it was a livery, it was a theater. And it was called the People's Theater. The barber shop was still in the front. They still had the businesses in front. And it looks like there was a tailor shop there on the south side now in the front. 
that could have very well been the costume shop, uh, although it could have been just tailoring because that was his profession. So it could have been just a tailoring shop, and later on he went into costuming. And before the People's Theater, it was actually a billiard hall. Of course, this goes all the way back into the late 1800s, about 1892 to 1898, right in that area. And in 1887, it was the Princess Skating Rink, roller skating, of course. So this building's had quite a history. And then, of course, before that, there was the First Methodist Church, which we've already looked at in a previous video. If we move uh, one door south of where the Old Times Herald building used to be, you can see that large building there on the left-hand side. Well, that's actually this building right here, which was the Michigan Telephone Building. This was the third location for the telephone company, uh, and the second one they actually built specifically for the telephone company, the first being on 7th Street. And we'll get into uh, the history of the telephone in Port Huron when we cover the one on 7th Street. The building is still here today and is owned by AT&T. Before the telephone company building, there were actually two homes at that location. In this photograph, uh, you can see one of them quite clearly. You can't really see the other one. But uh, they were not only homes, but they were also businesses. Uh, actually, both of them were. But uh, the first one, it was next to the old livery or uh, people's theater, depending what decade you're looking at. And if you look closely, you can see the, the word Taylor on the signage on the side of the building. And at the Sanborn map, you can also see the, the word Taylor there, that that's what the house was used for at that time. And of course, I jumped to the conclusion right off the bat that this has something to do with the Lamaznes because that was his vocation by trade. But I was wrong. It was actually owned by a competitor, uh, a partnership of Godfrey and Godley. And this Godley is the same tailor that would eventually go over on Water Street that we looked at earlier in another video. Before that location was a tailoring shop, it was something else entirely. It was the Port Huron Mineral Bath Company. And again, you can see it from the Sanborn map. Thank goodness for Sanborn maps. They're so informative. And here we see an advertisement for the Mineral Bath House. The only electric baths in five states in Canada. Mineral wells 900 feet deep. Who would have thought? Cure the powers, the wonder of the age. Exceeding in strength and virtue those of the well-known waters of Mount Clemens. Prominent physicians give their unqualified endorsement. And they also had a ladies department with attendance. 7 a.m. to 9.30 p.m and even open on Sunday, which I'm kind of surprised back in that time. Most businesses were closed because of church, but this one was open only during church hours, basically, so go figure. The other home, as you see uh, in the foreground, was owned by Mrs. Annie Sadie, and it was actually a boarding house. And we know this, of course, because of the Sanborn map again. You can see where it says boarding on uh, that home. Just south of the boarding house is this brick building, and this was the Masonic Temple. And that building is still uh, here today. Uh, it goes now by the title of the Masonic Center. Here's a postcard showing uh, the Masonic Temple, and then just to the south of that, that uh, beautiful home that you see was actually a part of the Masonic organization as well. And that was the Masonic Clubhouse. Here you can see the Masonic Clubhouse and the temple uh, looking in the opposite direction. Here's another postcard from just a little different angle. You can see the clubhouse on the left and the temple on the right. In this uh, photograph here of the three homes, we see that the middle home is actually the Masonic Clubhouse. And this is from the uh, booklet of Port Huron in 1900. And we have one more photograph of the clubhouse. If you notice at the very bottom of this photograph, it says the Port Sharon Club. And uh, this was actually what it was before it was the Masonic Clubhouse. Uh, it was known as the Port Sharon Club or the Port Sharon uh, Commercial Club. 
In between that time period, that it was a Port Huron commercial club and then became the Masonic uh, Clubhouse, it was called the Crescent uh, Club. And it was the Crescent Club from about 1903 to 1907. And we can see from the Sanborn map that the clubhouse also had a bowling alley. Who would have thought? But sometime in between 1907 and 1924, it became the Masonic Clubhouse. The rest of the block going south from the clubhouse was finished off by three different homes. We only have a photograph of one of the homes though, and that was the one next to the clubhouse, as you can see here. In this black and white uh, postcard, you can see an expanded version of that house, a little bigger than it looked in the first uh, photograph. And you can see that there's also a little picket fence going around part of the house as well. Here's the same shot in a colorized uh, postcard of the house. When I was growing up, there was no longer a house there on 6th Street. There was a brick building called the YMCA. Notice to the right, you can see the uh, Masonic Clubhouse. But in this photograph here, the house is now gone. And it would appear that the YMCA has expanded uh, and by building another building right next to where the clubhouse was. And now this would be the entire YMCA. The YMCA had all kinds of different activities uh, for the young men that were going there. Uh, and I imagine in the early decades, they got around in something like this here. This is a local bus from the YMCA. My friend Barbara Boyce sent me some news clippings uh, and photos that were in the newspaper of some of these activities that the YMCA presented. I think you might be interested in them. I'll just scroll down and you can read it at your leisure. This was written before the program, and this clipping here, of course, is written after the program. And now let's just go through this as well. It's amazing how the meaning of a word can change over the years. I doubt very seriously if they would describe that gathering the same way they did in this article today. This is part of the YMCA Boys Choir that was referred to in the earlier articles. And this was for a family night program. I don't know if it was part of the original article or not, but uh, you can read the caption there. This photo cracks me up, mainly because I went to school with these guys and graduated with some of these fellows. This was the Hillbillies and the Y Boys Choir Show. Quite a title, and they look like the Hillbillies. I'll read the caption to this photograph and then I'll uh, put it up for you to look at it later, but maybe you can put the faces with the names. This is what it says. Hillbilly Orchestra that will perform in the Hillbilly Jamboree Musical Show presented by the YMCA Boys Choir at 8 p.m. Friday in Woodrow Wilson School. Includes from left to right in the front row, John Chittister, Bill Maxwell, and Craig Robinson. Second row, Jerry Howland, Fred Laughlin and Don McCullough. Back row, Jan Sharon, Rich Robbins, Dick Cunningham, and holding the jug, Doug McCullough. The show is the annual spring musical presented by the Boys Choir, and the free will offering will be for the benefit of the YMCA World Service Fund. And I'll post this, and then you can always pause and read it later. I'm not sure all the names line up with all the pictures of the way the caption shows. Uh, it's almost like trying to find Waldo. There's 10 names and there's 10 photos of uh, young men there, but a couple of them are really hard to find. But uh, you might know one of them uh, because uh, if you're about my age, uh, you know about how long ago it was. I mean, I'm 77 and you can kind of get an idea how old these guys are here. So it's been a while ago, but you might see somebody you recognize. Another popular activity they had in the YMCA on 6th Street was swimming. This was done in the basement of the YMCA. But back in those days, swimming was a little different than swimming at the YMCA today, mainly because the boys couldn't wear bathing suits. They swam in the nude, while the girls could wear bathing suits. I didn't think too much of it at the time, but uh, 
Today, with all the sexual perversion there is in the country, uh, I often thought, was this a perverted thing? Uh, were some of the directors there or perverts or what? So I decided to do some research on it. And this is what I found. I found that nude swimming classes weren't just a YMCA thing. In fact, they were a national thing. The American Public Health Association mandated them from 1926 until 1962, and thousands of high schools around the country enforced the tradition. In general, Americans might have been more buttoned up at that time, but when it came to all male activities like swimming, there wasn't much of a taboo around stripping down. Today, our society has so sexualized nudity, particularly child nudity, that we can't conceive of a time when kids went naked without any sexual implications. The first recreational indoor pool in America opened in Brooklyn's YMCA in New York in 1885. Because swimsuits back then were made of wool and their fibers would clog the pool's relatively unsophisticated filtration systems, nude swimming was enforced to make sure the pool didn't break. By the 1920s, there were other more comfortable swimming alternatives that didn't shed fibers. However, nude swimming continued. The rationale this time around was that nude swimming was more hygienic. For over half a century, no one really seemed to question the nudity rules. America had a surprisingly liberal attitude toward nudity, at least for the boys. Girls, on the other hand, were always required to wear full suits. I guess it didn't matter if the who plugged up with their wool fibers. Sentiments began to change around the early 1960s, however. Society norms shifted, and some boys and their parents began speaking up. In 1961, in the small town of Menasha, Wisconsin, high school boys and their parents petitioned the school board to allow boys to wear swim trunks to swim practice. The boys were affected morally, physically, and psychologically by forcing them to swim in the nude, one of the mothers noted at the meeting but the petition was voted down. The all-male board claimed swim trunks would be prohibitively expensive. They also claimed that swimming nude would build a man's character. Within the YMCA, there was no national mandate, so each location decided for herself on its nude swimming policies. The tide began to shift in 1961, and Irvin Bulger, the General Secretary of Allentown, Pennsylvania YMCA, reported to an executive YMCA conference that basically the reasons for nude swimming, wool fibers, and cleanliness no longer made sense for modern pools, which were then equipped with chlorine and powerful filtration systems. Nude swimming became less and less common in the mid-1970s, and boys were forever spared the nightmarish experience of stripped-down inspections. Today, if some head of the aquatics at the Y suggested naked swimming, let alone try to actually implement it, they would probably lose their job immediately. The fascinating thing about this story is that we tend to assume back then it was more puritanical than we are now, but that's not necessarily the case. It's a pretty interesting little narrative about American culture and body image and masculinity, an era that I remember well. Yes, there were a lot of pleasant memories that came out of that building and uh, some memories that were filled with apprehension. For example, I wonder who's peeking in those windows that are supposed to be fully covered. Oh well, we survived. The rest of the Black West of the YMCA consisted of just a couple other homes. In our next video, uh, we'll look at the opposite side of 6th Street and see what was there.